Thank you, everybody, for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. It's really a great honor to be here. I think this is an historic con conference. Um, and I'm very pleased to follow one of my good professors in graduate school, Randy Holcomb. Uh, so I want you to remember every word he said, because that's going to be important for my talk. And also my student, Paul Swick, whose talk is going to be really fundamental to some of the things I'm going to be talking today. So I want instant recall on both of those <laughs> lectures. I don't have enough time. I would talk about all the bad things I expect to happen in the next few days, few months, and few years, but I don't have nearly enough time for that. So I'm going to stick, <laughs> stick with some uh, fun stuff. I'm going to go back to my uh, really very early days, almost the first few days um, of mine in graduate school. I'm not going to recount all of that. I do have a lecture on YouTube. It's called Austrian, Econo Austrian Economics Then and Now, uh, which I gave at the 25th anniversary conference of the Mises Institute. It's a tribute uh, to Lou Rockwell and the Mises Institute. So if you're interested in the younger me, um, <laughs> that's the place to listen to it. Now, in the very early days of my graduate studies across the street at Auburn, um, a human action reading group was set up. And it was me and just a few other people, a couple of <laughs> other graduate students, um, a couple of friends from the institute, um, who were mostly objectivists, so it was got off to a kind of a rocky start. And I had never read Human Action at the time. I had never even had a copy of uh, Human Action at the time. I was interested in Austrian economics um, very much, but I was very much a novice. And the reading group uh, proceeded, you know, we would read like the first hundred pages and then get together and discuss it. Uh, that didn't last very long. <laughs> about the, the first couple of meetings was about it. Uh, we broke up after about 300 pages, um, as those first 300 pages are rather difficult. And they're difficult for a variety of different reasons uh, for both professional economists as, a, as well as just regular people. Uh, regular people wonder, what are all these insane criticisms that Mises is spending so much time addressing? And the professional economist wants to know, why doesn't he get on to regular economics? Uh, I'm going to talk about that a little differently uh, here today, uh, because I, I think I've eventually, I think I figured out how that all works. In the 1990s, I taught a cor course at Aus at Auburn University called Austrian Economics. It was an advanced undergraduate course. I had several doctoral students in the class. It was wonderful. Uh, it was a big challenge for me to stay up with the reading uh, in the course and to be able to really translate the whole thing uh, for the students. And the, the one interesting response I got in terms of teaching the course is that the average run-of-the-mill Auburn economics major would come up to me and say, you know, I really still don't understand what this Austrian economics stuff is, but I understand all my other courses a lot better. <laughs> and that was interest, very interesting to me, and I, I never really completely sunk home what, exactly what that meant. In more recent times, I edited the book The Quotable Mises. I used all of Mises's books to draw quotations from. I encourage you to get a copy of that book. It's very useful in terms of reading, understanding, research, writing, and so forth. And I came out of that with a recommendation for people to read the shortest Mises readings first and work your way on up to bigger books like Human Action. And I did have a few people come back to me and said that that approach did work for them. So instead of starting right with the beginning pages of human action, I said, go to get the policy, the applied things, work your way up to the small books, the big books, and then human action. 
Upon reflection in this class, I mean, in, in my class, doing the book, the reading group, um, and some of the things I've heard here today, um, we should note that many, many people read Human Action. It was a bestseller. It was a runaway bestseller for Yale University Press. It sold lots of copies. And I know many economists who read it. Uh, Professor Holcomb uh, mentioned uh, James Buchanan, who read it. Um, Gordon Tullock said that that was the only book he ever read on economics. And I think those two are probably good examples of people who got Mises's message and they were able to use it and appreciate it professionally. But I think most did not, even though many had read it or certainly heard about it, um, but they did not appreciate the book because it wasn't about doing economics the, the way they had been taught. But no doubt they must have absorbed some of the content that I'm going to review here today. It must have gotten through to them the thought processes that Mises takes us through in the opening pages of Human Action. So that many economists became true believers in what we might call rational economic behavior, which is something that really started in the 1950s. Public choice theory applying rational economic behavior to the public sector starts in the 1960s. The price theory revolution is something really or originating in the post-World War II period. In the formalist revolution, applying mathematics to economics also appears, starts to appear really in the 1950s. I'm going to argue or hypothesize that Mises and human action did have an impact. I've done a previous paper along my general lines here, which is Mises and trade policy. I'm going to be talking about trade in general. Uh, that paper uh, was Mises on Trade, Human Development, and Human Progress, and Government Policy. If you're interested in a copy of that paper, please email me and I'd be happy to send you it. In that paper, I discovered a quote in Human Action that I'm going to quote to you here. But the current paper, which I'm drawing from here this morning, looks at two points of analysis. One is the technical importance of trade in human action. And originally, it started out as a page count analysis, where I was just looking at all the pages on which Mises talked about trade and prices and those kind of things. Of course, it turns out that most of the book is directly or indirectly related to what we might call price theory today. And then the second point of my analysis, or my intended analysis in the paper, is the centrality of trade in human society. So very, two very big, big points there uh, with respect to Mises's views. And then, of course, I will go on um, in further research and look at more specifically at the role of policy, uh, but I wanted to quote to you from part six of Human Action, chapter 27, um, the chapter on the government and the market, on the meaning of laissez-faire, where Mises, again, attacks some popular misconceptions of both the market and government planning and specifically of government planning as a savior for the otherwise sort of vegetative state of the market. 
And I think this is important in why I'm groping towards a resolution of what Mises was getting at here, because uh, it's one, it's the only or maybe one of the few places in human action where Mises italicizes some words of his own. And I'll just quote the paragraph at fully, quote, the truth is that the alternative is not between a dead mechanism or a rigid automatism on the one hand and conscious planning on the other. The alternative is not plan or no plan. The question is who's planning? Should each member of society plan for himself or should a benevolent government alone plan for all of them? The issue is not automatism versus conscious action. It is autonomous action of each individual versus the exclusive action of the government. It is freedom versus government omnipotence. And the part that's italicized is automatism versus conscious action. Automatism autonomous action of each individual versus the exclusive action of the government, freedom versus government omnipotence. So that's obviously something of overriding importance. So back to human action itself. In part one, Mises, um, there's the quote. In part one, Mises famously lays out the subject, the method, and the structure of the study of human action by praxeology. He describes praxeology thusly. The scope of praxeology is the explication of the category of human action. All that is needed for the deduction of all praxeological theorems is knowledge of the essence of human action. It is a knowledge that is our own because we are men. No being of human descent that pathological conditions have not reduced to merely vegetative existence lacks it. No special experience is needed in order to comprehend these theorems. No experience, however, however rich, could disclose them to, to a being who did not know a priori what human action is. The only way to a cognition of these theorems is logical analysis of our inherent knowledge of the category of action. We must bethink ourselves and reflect upon the structure of human action. Like logic and mathematics, praxeological knowledge is in us. It does not come from without. All the concepts and theorems of praxeology are implied in the category of human action. So that's very important to Mises' whole development, his whole theorizing. It obviously sounds very methodological. Um, but in other words, what he's saying is that economic law should be obvious to us all. To the PhD trained economist of the 1950s, it means, oh, what does that mean? Uh, they didn't teach us that in graduate school. So this is methodology, but it could be called microeconomic theorizing. Much of this material is presented from inside the human brain, so to speak. Thinking and often, and often seems a re reflection of what Mises calls autistic action. action. This action is described as an exchange, but not explicitly a trade. Still, Mises described in such a way that the individual assesses the psychic cost and the psychic profits of the action relative to alternatives prior to action. So autistic action is, I want to make some coffee. I'm going to make some coffee. Okay, so I'm not involving anybody directly in that action. But I weigh the cost, the time and trouble it takes to make the coffee, and then I weigh the enormous benefit of actually getting the cup of coffee, and I decide to proceed stumbling down the hallway to the coffee maker 
to make that cup of coffee. And everybody should be able to relate to that, basically. Um, but it, it's, you know, that's great, but it's not very informative directly for the PhD trained economist, but it's something you also can't ignore, right? Mises is talking about the psychic cost, the actual cost, the psychic uh, profits or benefits of an action, um, and it just makes sense. Uh, it should make sense to everybody. Quote, action is an attempt to substitute a more satisfactory state of affairs for a less satisfactory one. We call such a willfully induced alteration an exchange. A less desirable condition is bartered for a more desirable. So he's talking about here in the case of an autistic exchange where I'm doing something with inside myself. I think about it and I act. It doesn't involve anybody else, but I'm rationally thinking through at some level the cost and the benefits in proceeding to an action. So again, it doesn't have a lot of meaning for somebody who's trying to write papers on the subject, but it's also something you cannot ignore. Using words such as alteration and bartered, Mises' description is almost interchangeable between autistic action when, within the individual and trades or exchanges between different parties. Um, so he's starting with autistic action and moving towards actual trades. He uses the Robinson Crusoe situation so we can think about the, the situations about production as well as consumption. And he works through using that scenario or that situation to define the elements of exchange, the cost and the benefits to Robinson Crusoe in the absence of a market, in the absence of other people, and how Robinson Crusoe proceeds. So he's making the translation from autistic exchanges to market actions, market exchanges. Um, but again, for the casual, confused reader, this may seem like methodological mumbo jumbo. How does that help us increase GDP, for example? How does that reduce unemployment? What does that tell us about the problem of inflation? So even if it does sound like methodological mumbo jumbo, it is very difficult not to absorb the message that Mises is telling the reader. After all, the same principles apply whether you are making coffee in the morning hiring a clerk in your store, you're going through the same basic process, purchasing a new car, or making an investment. You consider the cost and the likely benefits before pursuing an action. Now, as several people have noted, prior to the publication of Human Action, American economics and really worldwide economics was dominated by a pluralism where there were many competing ideas, approaches, and methodologies. Austrian economics was what but one small element within that pluralism, which has hence become sort of a overall hegemony of a single approach but prior to human action, prior to World War II, there was a multiple of processes and ideas. Mises' human action brought many of aspects of that pluralism into question. And uh, as a matter of fact, just like today, uh, the neo-Veblenian strands of economic thought are also trying to bring or question um, aspects of 
Austrian economics or good economics with uh, things like behavioral economics, uh, psychology, market imperfections, and so forth. It was Mises in human action that first presented this pure process. And much of the method of dis in discussion um, regarding methodology was really Mises critiquing the mistakes within that pluralism, the Veblenian issues, the psychological issues, various social strands of the issues. And in terms of page count, um, the rest of the book in terms of talking about trade and talking about exchange and prices, uh, part two explains the, the concept of human society as a network of exchanges and trades uh, involving superior productivity based on cooperation, as well as revealing the problem, the looming problem of economic calculation. Part four, the problem is solved with money prices, which permits economic calculation. And the remainder of the book is based on the existence of trades conducted on the basis of money prices and economic calculation, the impact of government interventions into that process, and the outcome of exchanges where there is no private property, money, and economic calculation. So the vast majority of human action is about either price theorizing in the early chapters or what might be called applied price theory in most of the remainder of the book. Hence, while few economists would consider von Mises as primarily a price theorist, the vast bulk of his treatise, Human Action, is devoted to trade and price theory, distortions of trade patterns and cycles, and the human condition in the absence of trade and prices. So I think there's a good case to be made that Mises's human action was read by many people. I think people in the real world probably understood the, back, the book much better. Um, entrepreneurs, for example, would probably understand the book much better than PhD economists or university students without any experience in the world. Um, and as a result, many, many people dismissed uh, human action or they basically, like my initial weeks in graduate school, stopped reading it um, uh, because of the, the difficulty and the lack of familiarity with the material in the opening sections, which I now consider to be the most vital and most brilliant parts of the book. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to tell you what I do in the second part of <coughs> this paper, which is on the centrality of trade in human society. Uh, this is something that Paul covered um, in his le earlier lecture, uh, showing the benefits of cooperation. And, and, and in fact, I'm basically quoting Mises in supporting of much of what Paul said um, about Mises' uh, discussion of the division of labor, the fact that we are naturally inclined to participate because we can rationally figure out that we can benefit from the greater productivity of production based on the division of labor, and that's why it left to its own devices, it's something that continually develops, blossoms, and grows uh, over time. And I also discuss some of the criticisms of Mises's approach. People who say, well, the, you know, uh, you need the government or God intervened or blah, blah, blah. And Mises says, well, you know, if you don't have uh, trade and the division of labor, you don't have society and all of these, those other wonderful things from religion, um, high standards of living, um, 
social belonging, friendships, all that sort of stuff is only really the result of the fact that we are impelled to work so closely with one another to our mutual benefits. And at the same time, it raises our standard of living so that we can devote time not to just mere survival, but to express ourselves and to investigate some of the higher callings of life. So it's very, very interesting stuff. Uh, Hillary Clinton would not like this part of my paper, by the way. Um, and, uh, and so, again, I think it's very, very important. I think Mises did have an impact um, that has gone largely unnoticed. And uh, I think I'll bring it to a close right there. Thank you. Anybody, does anyone have a question? Okay. Okay, a couple of things. Um, one, when you talked about the importance of people having experience in business and entrepreneurs being on top of that, uh, we've got some entrepreneurs who are trying to rule the world now, Bill Gates being one of them. And so uh, there's a limit to that. Uh, secondly, some of the stuff you said, a lot of stuff you said, like impelled to work closely together, um, it goes back to uh, evolutionary psychology, human, basic human nature. And I keep thinking that, because I've studied some evolutionary psychology, but not much e economics, that uh, a, a, someone who, who brought those two together would strengthen uh, Mises' ideas of human nature. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. And basically, I think what Mises is saying is that the the rationalization of the idea that working together produces more benefits. It allows us to do things we can't do as individuals. So there were certain early, in the early stages of human development, where we had to work together in order to accomplish certain things. Or we died, or we died yeah. And, but then we, we learned uh, over time that the, the productivity benefits of the division of labor, and we became, of course, sedentary. We became uh, developed from, you know, basic survival into living in structures and trading and uh, manuf manufacturing tools and so forth. Um, and all of those developments involved uh, an increasing division of labor, which, you know, taught us the benefits. Uh, the experience was a great teacher, and that obviously has a, hopefully, I mean, has an impact on our psychology as well, although we know that, you know, people can be psychologically manipulated against that kind of thinking as well. Okay.